What I want us to study in today's lesson is leadership and the need of leadership in this world. We live in a world that is missing leadership. Among our political leaders, so often we see more failings and people tend to vote against somebody rather than vote for somebody. And we see more and more in the cultural arena, we lack true moral leadership. When you look in our culture, the people who lead our culture, whether they be sports stars, whether they be music stars, whether they be influencers of whatever sort, rarely are they the kind of leaders, examples that we need and that we're able to follow. As a matter of fact, in many churches, even among the Lord's church, there is a lack of leadership. Ezekiel put it this way, Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30. As he was living in a refugee camp and he was thinking about the destruction, coming destruction of the city of Jerusalem. He said, we need men who will stand in the gap. And what he was talking about was perhaps a military formation, perhaps standing in the gaps of the holes in the wall to defend the city. And he said, there's no one who stands in the gaps. There's no one who will step up and defend what's important. And we're aware of what happens in the book of Judges. After having great leadership through Moses and having great leadership through Joshua, the book of Judges is about what happens to God's people when no one will stand up. <clears throat> now, whether you read in Judges 24 or Judges 21, 35, we're aware of that passage. And that passage says, in those days, there was no leader in Israel, but everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we see that more and more in our country, in our culture. And what this world needs, what the church needs, is leadership. Now, the majority of our sermons talk about how to be saved, right? You hear God's word, you must believe and have faith, you repent of your sins, you confess the name of Jesus Christ, and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. And those are important sermons. It needs to be preached. The gospel needs to be preached every time we get together. But what does God expect of you, of me, of us, once we become a Christian? I've never heard it said, but sometimes it's implied that once you obey the gospel, all that we really expect is for you to sit in a pew, show up at the right building at the right time, perhaps give. But far too often within the Lord's church, we just expect you to be here. And we don't impress, we don't express the need for God's people to lead. But that's what God has called each one of us to do. You need to be a leader in your family. An example of what it means for Jesus to live within you. You need to be an example in your school and in your church. People need to see that salt, that light. People need to see the power of what the gospel can do in your influence. And the Lord sorely needs leaders within the Lord's church. Among the churches of Christ across our country, very close to 40% of them do not have a preacher. Now, some of that happens because many of these congregations are smaller, can't afford anybody to work full-time there. But there's also another problem. Our people are not raising up our young men to be preachers. That's one of those occupations that people don't look up to anymore. That's one of those things where people don't strive and say, man, I want to grow up and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have, as a brotherhood, gotten to the point where we don't honor and treasure those who rise up to preach the gospel. Within many congregations of the Lord's church, there are churches which are organized, but they're not yet organized spiritually. And there may be qualified men, but people don't feel the need, people don't feel the drive to stand up and be leaders in the Lord's church. As a matter of fact, even within just about every congregation, there is trouble. 
It's hard to find Bible class teachers. It's hard to find volunteers. It's hard to find people who are willing to do more than just sit in a pew. And yet God has called us to lead. The church has a responsibility to develop leadership. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, the things which I'm teaching to you, I need you to also pass those on to faithful men who will speak these things as well. And so Timothy recognized, or Paul recognized, writing to Timothy, it was important not only to preach the word, it was important to also raise up others who would follow after him. To raise up other people who could teach the word of God. To raise up other people who are willing to step out and to lead. Well, how do we develop and encourage leadership within the church? What is it that you and I need to do as Christians to develop and encourage leaders? Well, the first question is, what is a leader? A leader is a godly servant who knows where he or she is going and who people will follow. What do we mean by that? A godly servant, it needs to be a person of character. You have to love the Lord before you can lead in the right way. You have to be a person who believes in what you preach. You have to be a person who is willing to give yourself to God. He needs to be a person who knows where he's going. You can't be a leader unless you have vision. You can't be a leader unless you see a direction to go in. And that direction is the way in which God would lead us. And if you are a leader, you need to have somebody who will follow. You need to live life. You need to have, be the kind of person that people will follow after. And so how is it that you and I, as Christians, in our congregation, what is it that we do in order to raise up leaders? First and foremost, we do it by our prayers. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 2, Jesus, as he is talking about the, uh, the fields which are ripe unto harvest, he tells his apostles, he says, pray to the Lord that he will raise up leaders. Pray to the Lord that he will raise up people who can come and harvest this field. Over 7 billion people live in this world. Over 325 million people live in this country. Over 1.3 million people live in our commonwealth. And over 34,000 people live in Marshall County. The world is ripe for harvest. And we need to pray to God, pray to the Lord that he will raise forth leaders. People who are willing to lead in teaching the gospel and bringing people to Jesus. People who will step out and bring other people through the gospel to God. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul, after he's talking about the Christian armor, which is there, he says, listen, brethren, I need you to pray. Because that's the overwhelming part of the Christian armor. Pray that I may preach the gospel in the way that I should. Pray that we can preach. Pray that we can lead. And that we can bring people to God. We bring people to leadership by the words in which we say. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11 says, Comfort one another with your words which you are doing. We need to lift up leaders with encouragement, with compliments, with advice, with help. You help people be leaders by the things that you say. Look in the very next two verses, verse 12 and 13 of 1 Thessalonians 5. It talks about how you need to recognize those who labor among you. You need to esteem them highly. A saying over the past generation was one of the reasons why we don't have leaders in the church is because of stewed elders and roasted preachers. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, at the dinner table, after church has happened, wherever we go, whether you eat out, whether you're at home, what do you say? 
Do you talk about the prayers being too long? Do you talk about the singing being off pitch? Do you talk about the sermon, which didn't seem as exciting that day? Do you talk about the decisions, which perhaps elders made, that you don't agree with? Do you talk about how the preacher uh, offended you, and you don't like him really all that much? Sometimes we fill our conversations with that around the dinner table, and then a few years later, we wonder why our kids don't want to go to church. But if our kids have grown up only hearing the problems of the church, why would they want to be a part of the church? Why would they want to participate in the church? Why would they want to give themselves fully to God? But when we speak good things of our leaders, when we find a positive and amplify those things, when we lift up our leaders by our words, then we accomplish great things. We develop leadership through our prayers, through our words, and through our action. We read in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 17, verses 12 through 13, about a battle that Israel was in. And as Israel was going through the battle, Joshua was down there fighting, leading the army. Moses went up on the mountain and he began to pray, giving glory to God. And we read that as long as he was focused and giving glory to God and his hands were raised, Israel would win the battle. Moses is an older man. It's pretty hard to do. And his arms become heavy. And when his arms began to fall, when he loses that focus and glory to God, Israel begins to lose their battle. And so two other leaders in Israel, Aaron and Hur, come, and they find a chair, a stone for Moses to sit on. And one holds one arm and the other holds the other arm. And they support Moses as he gives glory to God. And then Israel wins the battle. Are you someone who supports the leadership? Are you one who helps people, who lead, who is there for them during that time? You encourage leadership by your actions. In Acts chapter 16, looking there in verse 1 and 2, we read about Paul, and he comes to Lystra, and as he's there, he meets a young man named Timothy from a broken home. His, both of his parents aren't Christians, just his mother and his grandmother. And Paul takes that young man with him as he goes along on his journey. He raises him up to be a preacher of the gospel. Now, in this day of persecution and during this day of having to flee authorities oftentimes, during this day of great danger, don't you imagine how difficult it would be to always have this young man with you? Paul would have been lighter, it would have been easier if he would have left Timothy behind and kept doing the work, but Paul recognized the importance of bringing someone along to raise up as a leader. What you see here is a man with his action raising up leaders for the church of the future generations. And we, through our action, need to raise up leaders. I'm not just talking about elders, and I'm not just talking about preachers. I'm talking about Bible class teachers. I'm talking about people who work around a building. I'm talking about people who work in the community in doing things in the name of God. I'm talking about people within their own families. We've got to raise up leaders among our people and among our land. And so the question is, what is it that leaders do? What is it that we need to do as leaders? Well, first and foremost, you've got to take responsibility in your leadership. You've got to realize it's not easy. And it's not always simple. And it's not always fun. I joke around a lot of times and tell people, I love being a preacher. Growing up in church, I talked all the time. And I finally found a way that I can come to church and talk and I don't get in trouble. Now, I still get in trouble if I talk too much. People got to get out and eat lunch. But you see, there comes a great responsibility with leadership. In James chapter 3, looking there in verse 1, it says, Let those who teach realize that they are under a problem of condemnation. And what James is talking about here is he says, Be careful. When you take on the role of leadership, especially within the Lord's church, There is a great responsibility that's there. Your words 
carry influence. The things you say, the things you do, affect not only yourself, but also the souls of other people. And as Christians, we need to recognize that there's a responsibility that comes with leadership. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and Acts, Acts chapter 20, we see the three terms for elders of the Bible. They're elders, which means they're mature, they're pastors or shepherds, which mean they take care of the flock. They're bishops or administrators, which mean they handle the everyday work of the church. In each one of those terms, you see responsibility and responsibility, which is there. For preachers, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering. Because there's going to be other people who rise up who are looking at folks with itching ears. They're going to say whatever it takes to be popular, whatever it takes to be liked. But you, Timothy, you stay faithful in your ministry. It's a story about an older man and a younger man and a mule. And as they were walking to a city, they were walking along, and somebody saw the older man and the younger man walking along, and they said, how silly. These two people are walking, and one of them, at least, could be riding. They just don't know what they're doing. Well, the two boys, the older man and the younger man, looked at each other and said, you know, they're right. So they both hopped on the mule. And as they're going along, somebody looked and said, how cruel. They're both on this mule. That's so much weight on that animal. They're so unwise in what they're doing. And so they thought, well, okay, that's right. And so the younger man said, hey, I'll be on the ground. You're older. You hop up there. And as they went along, people looked and said, oh, that's mean. Why would that man be on that mule and making that kid walk behind him? That's not good. And they said, you're right. And so they put the younger guy up there, and he was on the mule, and the older man was walking. And as he went along, somebody said, well, how cruel. He doesn't respect his elders. He's on the mule, and he's making this old man walk. There are many times where whatever you do, you're not going to please people. And you've got to recognize as a leader how to take criticism. Listen, learn, but don't lose your heart. Be faithful and please God and not men. But recognize when you take that position of leadership, whether it be in your family, whether it be in the PTA or worldly organizations, whether it even be in the Lord's church, there are going to be some times where people do not appreciate the effort and the work that's there. But you're not there just to please people. You're there to help people. You're there because God has called you to be a leader. Leaders must have a personal relationship. They personally must walk with God. Paul stood before the Roman official in Acts 24, verse 16, and he says, I want you to realize I have been blameless before God and man. Now, does that mean Paul never made a mistake? No. But it means that Paul realized he lived in the glass house. And he realized that most important was his relationship he had with God. He needed to do the work in which he was doing with a pure heart for the right reason. You must love God before anything else in this world. Ezekiel 34, how many sermons you see that quote Ezekiel twice. Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel talks about these selfish shepherds. And what he's talking about there is the leadership in Israel who had become so corrupt, they were worried about money, they were worried about prestige, about all these things like that, about how to advance themselves and their own causes, that they had forgotten the reason they were in that position was to protect God's people. In juxtaposition of that, in John 10, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The hireling is going to run away whenever troubles come because he's just paid. It's just a job. He'll go find a better job. But Jesus says, I love the sheep. And my people love the sheep. My people know me and I know them because I'm the good shepherd. What you see there is a personal relationship. A love for people and a love for God. And that's what's needed for those who lead. The reason why you stand up in your family for God, it's because you love God. 
And you love those folks who are in your home. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. The reason why you're a good influence at school and at work is because you love God, but you love those people. People need to see the love of Jesus within you. They need to see that just as Jesus said, you love them because they're sheep without a shepherd. People need to see within the church leadership, people who walk personally with God, who love him and who are willing to suffer for him. Leaders have to work together. We read in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5, Acts 14, 23, uh, Philippians 1, 1, that God's plan for organization is multiple elders in one congregation. The church does not have just one pastor, which is a denominational concept. It's multiple people who lead a congregation. And as a team, these people have to work together. Now, among people, that's unnatural. So often, someone is going to have a stronger personality. Someone's going to have more experience. Somebody's going to be more eloquent. And we end up a lot of times with chief elders. But that's not the biblical concept. We have to work within a team of leadership. Sometimes you see a church which is dominated by its preacher. Sometimes you see a church which is dominated by the elders. And we forget we're all on the same team, that we're all working in the same direction, that we're all trying to bring people to Christ and help the congregation be what God has called us to be. We've got to work as a team. Also, we see leaders, the reason they're there is to help other people walk with God. God doesn't call us to be a leader for fame. God doesn't call us to be a leader for notoriety. God calls us to our task because we need to bring people closer to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7, verses 17 says, Obey those who rule over you because they will give an answer for your soul. Give them a job which is easy because you're being faithful to God. Your number one task, your number one role as a leader is to bring people to Jesus. To bring people closer to God. The master, the shepherd, left those 99 sheep to go find the one. So many people looking there at Luke 15 would say, you know, that's economics. You're going to lose something out of your flock. That's what all farmers, shepherds do. Some people say, hey, don't risk these 99 and lose that one. That doesn't make much sense. But the shepherd loved his sheep. And he was going to do whatever he could to bring that sheep back to its fold. That's the role of a leader. Now, as we go to our last slide... We see our Lord needs leaders. And we go back to that passage which Jesse read for us a few minutes ago. And notice the context of that passage, okay? Here you are in the book of Judges. God's people have fallen apart because there's no one who will lead. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes. And then you see Deborah under the terebinth tree judging Israel. Some people take Deborah and they say, okay, this means some doctrinal changes. Throw out 2 Timothy 2, throw out this 1 Corinthians passage. And they're busy taking Deborah and making her what she's not. Deborah lived in a world where nobody would stand up for God. And when the head of Israel came to her, she said, this is what you need to do. And he said, I can't do it. Nobody will lead me. I can't do this job. When J.L. was working with Sisera, nobody else would do the job. And what you see in the life of Deborah is what happens to God's people when nobody will rise up. When nobody will do what they need to do. And so we see in Deborah's song there in Judges chapter 5. You see how it opens. Chapter 5, verse 2, Oh, when the leaders of Israel will lead, God bless the Lord. Imagine what this world would be like if we rise up as leaders. 
if we lead in our churches, if we lead in our families, if we lead in our lives and direct people to Jesus, imagine what could be done. There's too many people who are afraid of the big armies. There's too many people who are afraid of the responsibilities which are there. There are too many people who are too busy with all the things in the world that they leave God's people without a leader. What God calls for us today is to lead. To be what He has called us to be. To not worry about the sayings of others. To not worry about the overwhelming criticism of what somebody may think about us. But to stand up and to use our talents for God. Now this day, each one of us is in a different situation. You have life circumstances which are very different than my life circumstances. You have life experiences very different than my life experiences. And you have talents and abilities which are very different than the talents and the abilities that I have. But you know what we have in common? God has called every one of us in whatever state we find ourselves to be in to stand up, to fill in the gap, and to lead for Jesus. To do that, you need to be a New Testament Christian. You need to have made the decision to put God first in your life and to follow after Him. And that culminates in the act of baptism. To do that, you need to give yourself fully to God, to repent and change from the ways of this world and conform to the spirit of holiness. To do that, you have to break out of laziness. You have to break out of being comfortable. You have to break out from what this world will tell you to do. But when the leaders of Israel shall lead, God bless the Lord.